Welcome. My name is Joel Hart, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Panama Baptist Church, and we are so glad that you've taken the time to join us online. Thanks for being with us, for making this a priority. If, if you're here with us at the live chat gathering and you haven't already, please say hello. We'd love to be able to greet you. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment and we can connect with you in that way as well. Here's a random fact for you as we get started in our time together. Did you know that the Eiffel Tower can be 15 centimeters taller during the summer? It's true. Due to thermal expansion, meaning the iron heats up, the particles gain kinetic energy, and they take up more space, the Eiffel Tower can actually grow taller in the summer. It's neither here nor there. Just a little trivia that you can impress your friends with. Okay, uh, let me open our time together by praying for one of our missionaries that we support here at Panama Baptist Church, Morgan and Pam Sickler. They minister with Kingdom Air Corps in Alaska. Uh, we're going to pray for four things specifically for them, that uh, their summer flight training will go well, uh, that the students' time at Kingdom Air Corp will give them vision and experience in getting them into the mission field. Uh, we're going to pray specifically for Pam, that she'll find the right speakers for the summer to challenge and inspire the students and the volunteers there. Uh, Pam and Morgan will be transitioning into some new roles there in the office and in the hospitality area of the ministry, so we want to pray that that goes well. And then also Morgan and Pam will have wisdom in parenting and raising their kids to know and fear the Lord. So I'm going to pray. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we want to lift up Morgan and Pam Sickler. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to partner with them, but God, that they desire to serve you with their lives to make your kingdom known. God, I pray specifically as they get ready for their summer flight training, all of the work that's going to go into that to get ready for the students and their families to come this summer to learn to be missionary pilots, that the training will go well, that you will keep everyone safe in the training that goes on there, that their experience gained this summer there at Kingdom Air Corp will help them and benefit them as they get on the mission field and seek to serve you in that way, I pray for Pam as she, as she searches for the right speakers to come for the summer, that they will uh, challenge and inspire the students and the volunteers. You would just put her in touch with just the right people that you would have to be there to speak. And for Pam and Morgan, as they transition into some new roles this summer, Lord, in the hospitality and office areas, those transitions would go smoothly. God, this would be a good use of the gifts and the talents that you have given to them. And, and also for Morgan and Pam, as they raise their kids uh, in an environment there that's just very busy, uh, it can be remote, uh, but that they would raise their kids with just wisdom and discernment and intentionality in raising their kids to know and fear you and to be disciples of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. It's time to share some God hunts. I hope you've been thinking this past week about ways that you've seen God at work and that you are ready to share. After the God hunt video, James and the crew will come and lead us in a couple of songs.
Jesus, I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. Taylor Mason is a very entertaining comedian and an amazing ventriloquist. And in his clip uh, about Paquito, oh my goodness, it's so entertaining. I encourage you to Google it right after we're done here. Just Taylor Mason, Paquito, uh, it's P-A-Q-U-I-T-O. Uh, his clip where his piglet puppet, Paquito is uh, going to try to overcome one of his big fears on stage and, and perform a feat that Taylor has designed for him. And it's very entertaining uh, as Taylor is trying to encourage and motivate Paquito to live up to his ability and up to his potential. He, he challenges Paquito to, to say, I'm the man, right? And Paquito's like, I'm the man, right? And Taylor's like, no, like you own it, like you mean it. And finally, Paquito embraces the fact that he is the man, he is strong, he is powerful, and when he does that, he's able to conquer his fear and do this amazing feat that, that Taylor has designed for him to do. It's very entertaining to watch. Uh, the crowd's interaction is, is probably as entertaining as uh, Taylor's amazing uh, ventriloquism act. We're like Paquito. We always live out our sense of identity. What we believe ourselves to be at the core of our being shows up in our actions and in our attitudes and in our outlook on life. This is a big thing for us. There are lots of problems that result from not having a really solid core identity. The, problems that come just because we don't have this nailed down at a foundational level of who we really are. Let, uh, let me just run through a few of these things, you, but this is nothing new. You know this. You've perhaps experienced it. You've certainly seen it in the lives of other people. When we don't have a solid core identity or we don't know what our core identity is, we lack confidence. Like Paquito, we, we lack confidence. And when we lack confidence, we lack courage to face the things that come into our life. A uh, second problem is, I'll call it the chameleon habit, that constant adaptation to our surroundings like a chameleon. And so when we're with one group of people, we acted one way because we think of ourselves in a certain way. And when we were with a different group of people, we have a different ID. And, and we uh, adapt that way. Now, there's a certain amount of adapting to your roles that's right and proper and good, but this adapting at the core level or not having a solid core, that's not good. In fact, it's exhausting, right? As you're constantly changing and trying to read the surroundings so that you can match up your identity with what, you know, the situation you find yourself in. Not only is it exhausting, it's dangerous. Because if other people realize that who you are and therefore what you'll do and who you'll be and how you'll act and the outlook you'll have, all that will change depending on who you're with. You, you're in a dangerous spot. You are vulnerable to manipulation. It's really a tough thing. It's a bad thing. It's a dangerous thing to not have a solid core ID. And then lastly, we talked about this in our part one, there's that angst that goes with not having a solid core identity because we, <laughs> we're wired to need to know who we are. And when we don't know who we are, we have that angst of trying to discover or, or uh, to create a core identity. 
And, and just, you know, to run off where we talked about last, last week, if, if our core identity is meant to be found vertically, in other words, we get it from God, then looking for it horizontally through our roles, through our tribes, or our performances, or looking for it internally through our preferences, that's not going to work in the end if it's meant to come down vertically. And so there's angst that could lead to, well, despair or an identity crisis. So it is really important to know who you are. Now, as we talk about this, I'm aware that some of you are in a great place. You have believed everything I'm going to talk about in, in this part, particular part. You've believed it for years. You have embraced it, and, and you've hung on to that through thick and through thin. And so you're not struggling with angst. You're not struggling with aimlessness. You're not struggling with who am I. That's awesome. That's awesome. As you listen to this, um, I would encourage you to let this be a time of worship, thanking God for what he has delivered you from. Friends, there are hosts of people around you who do not have the confidence, who do not have the sense of identity and purpose that you have, that you've gotten from your relationship with God. And so as you listen to this, let this be a time of worship for you, thanking God over and over for what he has revealed to you that you have believed and embraced throughout the years and have borne amazing benefits in your life. All right, let's pick up where we left off at the end of part one. According to God, the God who claims to have created us, all humans have at least two parts to their core ID. In part one of this series, we looked at the first part of our core ID, the fact that we are image bearers. Let's go back to the Genesis account to pick up the second part of our core ID. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, same text we looked at last week, but there's more to it. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. All right, so here's the second one. You notice it in those words, rule, subdue, right? Rule the creatures, subdue the earth. We are meant to be, this is part of our core ID, ruler. Or as I'm going to call it, just because I like how it sounds and the image that it creates in, our, in my mind, lion tamer. So you're an image bearer, you're a lion tamer. That has two basic sides to it. The one is the rule side, right? We rule, we exercise authority over creation in order to facilitate thriving, our thriving, the thriving of others around us, and even the thriving of creation itself. The second aspect of this idea of being a lion tamer is we are stewards. We manage what belongs to the owner for the benefit of the owner. In this case, the owner is God. He owns everything. He created it. He owns it all. But he allows us to steward it. And it's an amazing thing to be a steward because you don't have to fix everything, but you do get to manage it and you do get to use it. It's a wonderful position. Now, you know, as we talked about last week, that just like when sin entered the world, it defaced our ability to be image bearers. It's, it's still there. It's not erased, but it is defaced. Sin did a similar kind of thing to this part, too, of, of our core ID. It messed with our uh, lion tamer aspect of our ID. Sin did it by, well, it corrupted our inclinations. It, the, the things that we kind of are inclined to do or habitually do. And so now, because of sin, we have got to be careful because instead of ruling and subduing the earth, we try to subdue not the earth, not the fish. We try to subdue image bearers. That's the inclination of sin, is to instead of ruling and subduing the earth, we try to subdue image bearers. Instead of stewarding, we act like owners. We go around pretending this is all ours and we can do anything we want instead of realizing we're meant to manage it. And instead of caring for creation, we sometimes misuse or destroy creation. That's what sin has done. And so we need to be careful. But this, this part of us, 
that's meant to be a lion tamer that's not been erased. It's just been messed with, and we need to fight back against that. So what are the implications of being a lion tamer? I'm indebted to Matthew Hoskinson for these next few ideas. He said that it kind of comes down to two things. One, make the world better. Or he called it in a word development, right? Development. And how do you do that? How do you make the world better? Well, there's a couple different ways that we really practically we can do that. One is to identify places where there's chaos and work to bring order to it. That's making the world better. A second is this, to identify areas where there's potential and then work to develop those areas of potential. That can happen in our family. That can happen in the organizations where we work. That can happen in our communities. There's so many places where we can make the world better, either by identifying chaos and working to bring order, or by identifying areas of potential and working to develop that potential. Uh, the second big way that we carry out our lion tamer identity is to undo the effects of sin. This is the work of restoration, right? We want to undo the effects of sin. And we do that again a couple different ways. One is to look for areas of calcification. <laughs> you know, when your arteries harden, they're no longer pliable. They don't work right as a result. Sin has a way of doing that to our spiritual heart. And it makes you know, our heart brittle and hard and not pliable, not sensitive to God's leading. And so one of the things that we can do is look for ways to identify where in our family, in our home, in our own life, maybe with our friends, there's a lack of sensitivity to God's leading and look to see how can we undo that effect of sin? How can we bring back sensitivity to God, sensitivity to God's leading in a winsome and loving kind of way? Lastly, we undo the effects of sin by identifying areas of brokenness and working to bring healing. All this under this heading of lion tamer. You are a lion tamer. You get to help make the world better and you get to help undo the effects of sin. That is awesome. Now I want to pause for just a second here and make another observation with you. Even though we all have the same ID, right? We're an image bearer, we're a lion tamer. We express this, especially this lion tamer one, in very personalized ways, right? The areas where you're going to exercise dominion, the things that you're going to try to either bring some order to the chaos, or you're going to try to improve or develop potential, or you're going to try to uh, deal with brokenness and bring healing, is very different than the ways and the areas where I'm going to do it which is very different than the ways and areas where the next person is going to do it. This is, this is awesome. See, allowing God to assign us our core ID doesn't make us robots, and it doesn't make us clones. We're not robots because we have choice. That's part of being an image bearer, right? So we're not robots. God gives us the ability to choose, but we're also not clones. We personalize the way we rule, and what we rule, how we exercise dominion as a lion tamer. So I love that. The, the fact that God does assign us our core ID, and we all have the same core ID, does not make us robots, and it doesn't make us clones. All right, now we said that all humans have at least two parts of their core ID, right? Image bearers, lion tamers. All Jesus followers have at least two additional parts of their core ID. So they're still image bearers, they're still lion tamers, but there's at least two more. The first is they are God's friend. And I'm not going to fill this with new meaning. I want to actually jump back to what we talked about in the Easter prequel sermon there. There were three things as we kind of hit on this topic of identity back then. It said we are beloved by God, right? We are beloved of God. We're loved by God. Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God's the one who justifies, and who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He's also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. So what can separate us from the love of Christ? 
Can affliction, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? I mean, as it's written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. No, no, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Elsewhere, Paul said it. Really simply and succinctly, Colossians 3, verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy, dearly loved. Friends, you and I, if we are Jesus followers, we are beloved by God. Second, we are not God. I remember talking with you about this when we were looking at the Easter prequel. We're not God, therefore we have no right to expect others to serve us, right? Besides, Jesus, who is God, didn't even do that. And then third, we are lovers of God. You are a lover of God if you're a Jesus follower. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John writes, We love him, that's Jesus, because he first loved us. See, just a few verses earlier, John had said, We have come to know and believe that God loves us and that love that God has for us so convinces us that we want to love him back. We want to follow him. We want to follow Jesus. That's the first big implication, right? We want to follow Jesus. But there's another one. I, there, actually, there, we could spend the rest of our lives talking about implications of the fact that we are beloved of God. We're not God, but we are lovers of God. I just want to hit a few so we we'll want to follow Jesus. That's one. We already want that. Second, we're capable of loving people. Dwight Edwards explained this really well. Let me bring to you something that he wrote. He said, it's only natural that I desire your acceptance. The key word there is desire. Right? I desire your acceptance. Or we could say, I desire your love and your approval. Right? There's nothing wrong or sinful in that. But when I cease deriving my full acceptance from Christ, I'll begin to require and strive for your acceptance. Right? Why? Because I feel that I need it, right? If I'm not getting my acceptance from Christ, I'm going to need it from some other person, and I'll probably try to get it from you, right? So he continues, to the degree that I do that, I am incapacitated from loving you well. This insecurity may exhibit itself in a pushy, grasping style of relating that openly criticizes you're not being more caring about me. <laughs> Or it might come through in a quiet fear, refusing to ruffle feathers, lest your acceptance of me be jeopardized. But in either case, my ability to love you is sabotaged. The opposite is true. If I go to God to get all my acceptance, if I am convinced that at the very core of my being, I am deeply loved by God, then while I would desire your love and I desire your acceptance and I desire your approval, I don't need it. And if I don't need it, then I'm not going to try to extract it out of you if you don't give it to me freely. Does that make sense? If I get it from God, I've got it. So I don't need it from you. I'd still love it from you. <laughs> but I won't try to extract it from you. I won't try to require it from you. I won't strive to get it from you. I won't try to manipulate you into giving me your acceptance and your approval and your love. And Because I'm not doing any of those things, I am capable of actually loving you well. Oh, that's good stuff. When we were doing that prequel sermon, we were looking at how Jesus was loving his disciples there in John chapter 13, and he washed their feet, right? And we talked about that. He dealt with their dirt and their filth. And I remember saying in that sermon, I think having a core identity enables you to see the needs of others despite your own impending doom or your own pain, and, and then do what others are too afraid or too proud to do. Humbly accept what God brings into your life and to love others by serving them. I remember saying, your core identity enables you to live the blessed life. 
Oh, that's so true. So, implications, right? We want to follow Jesus. We're capable of loving, and we're able to accept what God brings into your life. And we could keep going. There's so much more, but I'm just going to move on to the next part of our core identity, and that is this. We are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. And so you and I, we are body parts, right? I'm a body part. You're a body part. We're one body in Christ, and we are individually members of one another. Paul explains in Romans 12, along with some other places, but in Romans 12, verse 3, you see this, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you to not think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly or realistically, right? Think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts, right? We are one body but we are members of each other. We are meaningfully connected. We are meaningfully connected. We are put together. And it's not haphazard. We're put together in, in, a, in a way that makes sense. And we are most definitely connected. We are not meant to live as islands. Uh, second, I, I love this implication. We're humble. Right? As we come to grasp, grasp this idea that at the core of my being, I am a body part. That implies that I am not the complete package. I am not the whole body. No one is the complete package. No one has all that they need in order to live well by themselves. And so we're humble. That's why Paul said to us, like, think sensibly, think realistically here. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. It doesn't make sense to think of yourself as being all of that in a bag of chips with bean dip, right? <laughs> be humble. Be realistic. But it's not just, hey, be humble. We're confident. Confident. Why? Well, because we're, we're both necessary and we're gifted at what we're supposed to do. See, if we are one body and we are individually parts and we have different functions and stuff, that means we are, every one of us is necessary. We are necessary. In another place, Paul explains, can, they, you know, can one body part look at the other and say, I don't need you? Can the eye look at the hand and go like, oh, pff, who needs you? No, that's just foolishness. We need each other. You are necessary. I am necessary. Oh, the confidence of knowing that you belong and that you bring something to the table that you're needed. Some of us are wired in such a way that this is kind of our life's fear and pursuit at the same time. And we're so afraid that the world will look at us and go, you're redundant. You're not necessary. God built us in a way that that is never a real danger. We are necessary because you bring something to the table. But think of how, on the flip side, how nasty it would be if you are necessary and you're supposed to do something, but the thing that you're supposed to do, you stink at. Oh, that would be terrible. That would be terrible. And so one of the beauties of all of this is God's like, here, look, I'm going to build you and wire you and gift you in such a way that you are needed and you belong and you're supposed to be connected, right? You are absolutely necessary. And if you don't show up, things aren't right. Things suffer. But he says, I'm also going to gift you so that you are gifted at what it is you're supposed to do. It's not just that you're going to be there. You don't just fill a hole. You're actually gifted at the thing that you're supposed to do. That is just awesome. All right. So let's start tying it all together. Know who you are. Know who you are. Man, this is so awesome. God gave you the ability to wrestle with identity issues. He made you a person that can think. He gave you the ability to wrestle with this and, and to... Try to figure out who you are. He gave you the ability to choose 
to accept and to affirm what he says about your core identity. Uh, which leads to the big question I want to ask. Do you accept? Do you affirm what Jesus says about you as your core identity? Or, or will you try to discover it on your own? And if you look for it on your own, where are you going to look? Are you going to look to your preferences, to your feelings, to your roles, to your tribes, to your performances? Where, where are you going to look if you're not going to choose to accept and affirm what Jesus says about you as your core identity? That's a question I think we need to wrestle with. For those who would like to affirm what God says about who they are, this is what I want to do. I'll let's end by reading the following together. So I'll, let's do it, all right? I know you're watching on video, but read the following aloud with me, these five statements about who we are at the very core of our being. And as you do so, don't just read it. Read it aloud and read it with a bit of belief and passion like you really believe it. All right, here we go. Number one, I am an image bearer. I am a lion tamer. I am not God. I am God's friend, and I am a body part. That's your core ID. Man, I'm praying for you and for me that we will fully not only accept, but we will affirm and we will embrace what God says about us. I'm looking forward to part three in which we'll get to talk more about how do we affirm and fully embrace our core identity. We'll see you there. Thanks, Pastor Andy, for reminding us of our true identity found in Jesus Christ. I'm praying for you this week as you seek to be deployed to the people around you, showing God's love and grace to others in the same way that God has shown it to you. If you need some help this week or just need someone to talk to, or you've got some questions about things that Pastor Andy has said, please reach out to us. Give us a phone call, send an email, or feel free to, feel free to drop by the office here. We'd love to be able to interact with you. All right, have a good week. Praying for you. We'll see you next time.